Cascade control is a very important concept to understand from a process control perspective. And the allure behind learning this in the first place is that it will get us better disturbance rejection uh, in some situations. And so to give an example, um, let's suppose we are operating some kind of heater in practice and we need to get water, uh, heat water up to a certain temperature for some critical reactor we're operating in a chemical plant. And so we have a, a set point for our temperature that we need to maintain. Um, and we have a really big reactor. So we've got a lot of water, uh, a very large volume of water to heat up. Water has a high specific heat capacity. And so because of that, the temperature of water will respond to perturbations in our inputs uh, pretty slowly. And uh, so like if you're dealing with thousand liter vessels, um, disturbances will only appear much later on and it will take a very long time for us to actually respond to them appropriately. And so in this diagram that I've constructed here, we have a temperature transmitter labeled TT and it is feeding uh, information, which is this dotted line, to a flow controller which controls the fuel flow rate into our heater um, to heat up the water. And so if we had some kind of perturbation, a step input, for instance, in some disturbance variable, um, perhaps the flow rate of water suddenly stopped, or um, you can name any kind of disturbance, um, our flow controller would eventually respond to it. Um, so we would have some kind of change here at TS, and uh, there'd be a perturbation. And then very slowly, we would kind of reach back to our um, the set point value that we have for the temperature we need our water to be at. And so what we get with cascade control is if we make use of an additional piece of information, such as the flow rate of uh, the fuel, and we feed this information to our um, controller as well, we can implement a nested uh, nested feedback loops and uh, realize much better feedback rejection. And so we would return back to our uh, desired set point value for our temperature much more quickly. Um, so in this case, uh, a flow transmitter um, would be a very good investment from an engineering perspective um, if the flow rate of our um, fuel stream could be considered a disturbance if it's not very constant with time. And so monitoring it and making use of that information is critical. And so uh, what I'll do next is go over how we can start designing um, process control loops to start taking this stuff into account. And so um, it looks pretty similar to what we're used to. Um, we have some desired set point value, in this case a temperature we want to reach. Um, and this set point value will be um, combined with the current measured value. And this air will be piped into some controller GC1. And uh, within GC1, this is where things begin to get interesting. Um, we now make use of this additional piece of information that we have, calculating an air, passing it into a, another loop, an inner loop, uh, and then that will go to some uh, process two. Um, and you can think of GP2 as like valve dynamics, for instance, um, in this situation. And uh, from there, uh, we would take into account any disturbances occurring within this loop. I shall call them D2 disturbances. And they will enter uh, the main process GP1. GP1 here would be the heater. And uh, from the heater, we could take into account any other disturbances occurring before finally having uh, our last disturbance or our um, actual uh, water temperature Y leaving. And so the main point here is we're making use of this, and I'll call this Y1, this Y2 term, which is our inner loop, um, and it will help us get better feedback uh, or better disturbance rejection. And so the thing to note here is that we can um, define this kind of inner loop region uh, as a slave loop, and uh, it might not be the most politically correct terminology, but um, what happens is the master loop um, 
output, in this case, whatever's coming out of GC1, will be the input to the slave. So the master dictates what the slave loop does. And so um, what uh, we get if we begin to more closely analyze this control block diagram and condense it, uh, just using control block diagram algebra, uh, we can begin to call this, so I'll call the slave loop uh, to be more politically correct, GC2CL. <laughs> And when we begin to combine our terms, um, what we'll find is that uh, we now have a little bit more simple loop, loop um, a set point value, um, and that's combined with an error or subtracted from it, has the error subtracted from it, sorry. And uh, this enters uh, the first controller, and now we have GC2CL. And this um, will actually go to our process, our main process of interest, which is GP1, which is just heating up the, the water. And uh, leaving this, we will have feedback. Uh, and so we begin to condense down our equations um, before uh, working our way up to having a, a characteristic equation that we can uh, begin to model and analyze further in Simulink. Uh, and also at this point, what we can do is define um, GC2CL as the following. And so using the um, classic uh, determining the closed loop transfer function, it's the same as everything else. Um, GC2 times GP2 divided by 1 plus uh, GC2 GP2. So this is the character equation and this is the product of all transfer functions between the input and the output of our loop um, we have defined what GC2 is and um, another thing they do in the textbooks commonly is they'll define something called GP1 effective and they will let this be equal to uh, GC2CL times GP1 because uh, by control block diagram algebra, anything in series you multiply together, anything in parallel we can add. Um, so now that we've defined GP1 effective, we can uh, now define the closed loop transfer function of our entire system. And we'll note how GP1 effective is equivalent to um, just combining these two blocks here. And uh, so finally, we have, if we wanted to know what the response um, of our output is to our input, which if I can use the eraser on this thing, sorry, um, the output here is Y1, the input would be SP, the closed loop transfer function will be equivalent to GC1 times GP1 effective divided by one plus GC1 GP1 effective. And so um, this will have a lot of terms, but this is the most condensed version. Um, and so with this uh, closed loop transfer function, we can begin to actually model our system. And so this um, concludes a, a general introduction into the motivation and theory behind cascade control. Um, I hope you guys find it useful. Let me know if you have any questions and thanks for watching.